Hello, dear friends, and welcome to the White Knight Summer Conference. This is Yelena, and I'm super happy to see you all here today. Let's welcome our next speaker for today, Tom Wichman, the head of games analysis at Muzo. Tom, are you here with us? Yes, I am. Good morning. Hey, good to have you here in the studio. How are you? Very good, thank you. And you? Good, very well. In Berlin. <laughs> well, <laughs> where are you, by the way? Um, I am in uh, Rotterdam, so the second biggest city in the Netherlands. Oh, nice. How's everything over there? Um, it's good. Summer yeah. is treating you well? Summer is, uh, well, summer is, is more or less treating me well. Yesterday we had rain, today there's supposed to be sun, so it's a typical Dutch summer so far. Okay, well, I understand. We're from St. Petersburg originally. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, we're very excited to listen to your presentation today. As far as I know, you have some really great news and numbers to share with us. About yep. this cool. Well, then we're all yours. Please the game. All right. Um, so again, welcome everyone. Thank you for uh, joining me this, this morning or afternoon, wherever you are joining us from. Um, I'll talk today. So I'll talk today about the um, 2020 games market and specifically um, the trends that are shaping this year's games market. Um, highlighting two specifically, um, talking about the impact of the current uh, pandemic going on and what that means for the games market. Um, but also looking at ahead at the uh, launch of Sony and Microsoft's new consoles at the end of the year and putting that in perspective of the global market. Um, now, to briefly introduce myself, um, why I'm here talking about this. So I work for Newzoo. I think that that might be a familiar name for many of us here, but just to reiterate what uh, Newzoo actually does. Um, so we are... Uh, the leading provider for games and esports uh, market data and intelligence. Um, we aim to be recognized and trusted as the number one provider of this intelligence in the world. And why me? Well, I lead Newzoo's uh, global games market research and analysis. Uh, the main uh, product of that being our global games market report, which we uh, publicize yearly, um, but update quarterly, and it contains all the numbers you will see in this presentation. Um, and as well as some qualitative data that I talk about as well. Um, very briefly, <laughs> we, um, we spent the last couple of years building a, a lovely platform where all this analytics can be found as well. So it's not just in a report anymore. Um, there's a free trial. I don't want to talk commercial too much. I'll, I'll go past this, but there is a free trial for that. So reach out to me if you're interested. I'll include my email on the last slide. Um, now, because I know that you are most likely here to hear some numbers, at least if you are familiar with Newzoo, I'm going to start you off with that. Um, and the first thing I wanted to look at today is the um, number of players worldwide in 2020. And that's actually, it's still, I see it every day, but it's still a remarkable number. So this year we'll have 2.7 billion people globally playing video games. Uh, that's a little over 5% more than it was last year. Um, and there's a couple of things to unpack here. So before I start to unpack this, um, the one thing I wanted to mention as well is that we do have a live chat during this presentation. So um, I will only be looking at the questions or your comments at the end of the presentation, but we can cover them then. So I uh, highly encourage everyone that has a question, a remark, an opinion on anything that I show today to share that in the chat, and we will cover it at the end of the presentation. Um, now, moving back to what we're seeing on the screen here, 2.7 billion, billion players, obviously an impressive figure. Uh, more than half of these coming from the Asian Pacific markets, um, which still houses some of the fastest growing markets worldwide. So then I'm talking about South Asia, mostly India, um, Southeast Asia as well. Uh, obviously the growth in, in more mature markets such as uh, South Korea, Japan, China is not no longer as big. Um, but what I also wanted to point out here is uh, the reason I start with players and not so much with revenues is because really, um, if we see, look at the last couple of years, engagement has become even more important than uh, revenues, or at least it starts with engagement and then the revenues will follow. And that becomes more true as more of the market shifts towards the free-to-play model. Uh, this year, 
for PC mobile and console combined, uh, we expect that 74%, so nearly three quarters of market revenues will come from in-game transactions, will come from directly from the free-to-play model. And the free-to-play model primarily grows with players and payers, um, not so much with, uh, um, not so much automatically with revenues or adding new games. So. Hence, we uh, focus more on players nowadays, uh, but we, of course, we still have the revenue data. Um, on the right here, you'll see that we have the players also split by, uh, by the platform they play on. Uh, mobile players, 2.5 billion, almost 2.7 billion. In a couple of years, we'll be talking about pretty much everyone being a mobile player, uh, particularly the new players coming from emerging markets. They tend to start with mobile, and then some of them um, grow or transition or add PC or console playing to what they are doing. Now, of course, that doesn't mean I won't talk about revenues. Um, looking at the market for revenues this year, 159.3 billion. That's uh, almost almost 160 billion. Uh, it's, uh, again, a very high number. Um, unpacking this a bit, uh, mobile gaming is by far the largest segment. It is almost as big as PC and console gaming combined. And we will get there pretty soon because it's also the fastest growing segment. Uh, the majority of that comes from smartphone games, but also tablet games, still a very impressive 13.7 billion forecasted for the end of the year. Um, PC and console gaming is uh, growing impressively as well. All three segments are growing. Uh, one decline is browser PC games. Um, and I'll come back to this number throughout the presentation, especially as I start talking about the impact that COVID has had. But, um, before we go there, but it's remarkable that prior to February, um, this number was lower, and especially the growth rate was a lot lower. Um, and now after February and April, when we did our first uh, sort of re, um, rehash of the forecast we had for the end of the year, um, that's the result that you're seeing now. Um, and it might even be that by October, when we do this exercise again, uh, this number might be even higher. If I'm looking at what I'm seeing in the second quarter of the year, then uh, it might even grow from here. So. Uh, very quickly, uh, the forecast, uh, again, as I said, mobile is growing faster than console and PC, so by 2020, uh, 2021, sorry, um, that will be half of the market. By 2023, it will be over half of the market, and by 2023, the total games market revenue will surpass $200 billion. Um, that is well ahead of any other entertainment industry, TV, music, cinema. So uh, it's a good time to be in games. <laughs> All right. Um, now, moving on to the next section, this is where I'll stop talking numbers for a bit and start talking more about what we've seen in the games market this year so far and how that has impacted our view of the market. Um, and the main to first main topic that I want to talk about today is uh, not necessarily COVID-19, but the lockdown measurements that were implemented to combat COVID-19. Um, and it's a double, as we say here, it's a double-edged sword, and I'll talk a bit more about that through uh, in the next few slides. Um, but the first thing that we saw, and bear with me as there's a lot of text on this slide, um, the first thing that we saw is really a massive spike in gaming activity, um, which resonated across several, if not all, consumer habits. Um, and we did a couple of uh, extra research. Uh, we did a bit of research into what was happening, how this was happening, why this was happening. Um, but really, we found people are spending more time play playing games. They are experiencing more games and more genres. They are playing for longer. They are streaming them more. Like every metric throughout the lockdowns, as soon as the market entered lockdown, we saw these metrics shoot up, um, which for us working in the games industry is, is of course a good thing. Uh, so we did a couple of different ways of looking at it. The first one being the motivations. We did a study um, for people who were in lockdown, if they were playing more and if so, if they were playing more, what was their motivation for playing more? Now, of course, the main motivation we found is that people had a lot more spare time or had a lot more time at home. Um, and that was the main reason uh, that they were playing more games. But almost equally important was the um, social aspect of playing. And that was a, quite a surprising find for us. But 
many people were turning to uh, to games either to to socialize with friends uh, or to socialize with strangers, but just to to have that connection with people um, through the game, and also to to catch up with family and friends, and and it, it sort of experienced the same in um, the type of games that we were playing. Like all of a sudden, we saw a resurgence of browser gaming activity, um, and smaller games like like Jackbox party games were all of a sudden uh, spiking up. Um, and we saw the same in genres. There's a general uh, boost to player engagement across most genres, but some were increasing greater than others. Now, here I have to point out that in no way that the lockdown is, is the most influential on what genres are growing or not. That is really so much more to do with what game releases. Um, here we took the example of Animal Crossing, um, which obviously broke records, 13 million copies sold in six weeks, fastest selling game on the Nintendo Switch. Um, now, there is no doubt in my mind that Animal Crossing would have been a success in any situation. However, the fact that it was a very social uh, simulation title that, that promoted social activity, it helped. It definitely helped. It, it caught people on the game faster, it caught them on longer, and it caught people to, through word of mouth, promote the game through others. And, um, anecdotally, we, I've seen, uh, we have seen uh, many people that bought a Switch that picked up the Switch Animal Crossing just to have for that social aspect of the game. Um, and partly due to the popularity of the game, the Switch has been sold out globally for the past few months, including the light now, uh, what I've seen uh, recently. Um, in terms of playing, um, Certain, certain titles saw a massive uptick in PC playtime, uh, mostly shooters, but again, that was also a lot to just accelerating what was already there or playing new games that would have been successful regardless, such as Warzone. Um, what is interesting is that the playtime has increased as well. And there we see a shift towards games that typically uh, require longer play sessions, such as Rainbow Six, Escape from Tarkov, the, you, the investment to start a game with that is higher than it would be of, of other smaller types like Warzone, Fortnite, PUBG. Um, and we did see that those games were, by comparison, more popular. Uh, so that was an interesting shift in behavior. And on viewing, again, the same thing is that it just increased what it was already there. One exception being sports simulations, obviously, during the lockdown ones, there was no real life uh, alternative to what is uh, like football, racing, um, and uh, viewing sports simulations on Twitch or YouTube, uh, Mixer at the time was a common replacement for viewing traditional sports. Uh, so a lot to unpack here, but I'm gonna move on because we did a little exercise uh, to quantify what the impact of COVID-19 was in the market. Um, and the way I did this, the way we looked at this is, what was our forecast pre-COVID for 2020 and what is it after? What is the difference? And then the difference in many cases we can attribute to the uh, lockdown impact. Um, I'll just start with the headline number. Um, our forecast there is that there is a 2.2 billion positive impact um, on the games market revenues for 2020. Uh, the majority of that going to mobile, um, PC as well and to a lesser extent console, but still uh, PC and console almost the same way. And I have to note here that this is just game software revenues, not hardware, because actually a lot of consoles were sold throughout the first half of the year. Um, and I'm looking at some of the forecasts by, um, for example, today I saw a forecast by our friends at MPD. We're saying that console spending is up 25% in the first half of the year. Um, so this doesn't discredit that. This is just saying that well, a lot of that is hardware. It's new players coming to the market, it's people buying a console and then buying one or two games for it. Um, you'll notice that some of the lines are a bit lower because it's not like it's hard to isolate just the impact on COVID-19 on global games revenue. So for example, we made a correction to console revenues, um, which we had to discount from this as well. But that uh, 2.2 billion is um, what we see as the impact of COVID-19 and specifically the lockdowns related to COVID-19 on the uh, global market. And as I said, this might even change by October. Um, the way we do it, we look at company financials. Uh, this is just based on Q1. Uh, we'll still get Q2 in over the next couple of months. And uh, judging from the first things we've seen, it might even be uh, more than this. So 
it's a bad situation, but it's not a terrible time to be in games. <clears throat> um, and a lot of questions we get like, okay, so we have this temporarily spike. Um, we see record engagement, see record playtime, record revenues as well. But how much of this is going to stick? Like what is, what is the part of this that is just the effect of the current situation or is it something that is permanent growth for the uh, market? Now, of course, this is looking a bit into our crystal ball. So we're not sure if this will actually um, come to pass, but this is the way that we look at it in the permanence. And, and the way we look at it is uh, we look at the player growth. And like I said earlier in the presentation with player growth comes revenue growth. And then we look at the expected stickiness uh, and the rationale for that as well. So I'll just go through this uh, list one by one. Uh, console um, requires quite a high upfront investment, like especially for new players, they have to buy a console. Um, they might be able to play on a console with a friend, but that becomes difficult during uh, social distancing. So most people, if they, they were new to console playing, uh, or if their revenues were going up, they had to make a high upfront investment, at least comparative to mobile PC gaming. Um, now, that means the player growth was low. That also means the number increase is relatively low compared to the other two, but the stickiness is very high because uh, like if people invest in a console, they are very unlikely to stop playing that as soon as they can uh, resume their relative normal life. So. Uh, low player growth with high expected stickiness due to the high upfront investment. Now, mobile is the complete opposite. Like, most of the people in the world already own a mobile phone unless we're looking at emerging markets, but fortunately, those are not the highest influence on, on these numbers anyway. Um, <clears throat> uh, but that means also expected stickiness is low because the lowest barrier to entry also means the lowest barrier to exit. Um, people can just download a game, they play it while they're in lockdown, and as soon as they get to go outside, they get to resume their normal lives, they might stop playing. And this is especially true because we've seen that hyper-casual games are a core driver for the player growth on mobile, but those, uh, due to the accessibility, due to the simplicity, uh, due to the even lower barrier to entry, also means that they, um, ex they accentuate that potential retention issue for mobile games. So it's the complete opposite of PC, uh, console. Um, PC is somewhere, somewhat in the middle. Um, also because here we include the browser players who return to an old hobby. Um, I highly doubt that the browser gamers that return for now will stick around for long because those are typically the people that turn to browser games to do as a means to socialize more than any other platform. Uh, and yes, there's a high upfront investment if you want to have like a proper gaming PC, if you want to play high-end PC games, um, then you need to invest as a new player in the, in the right components to be able to play that. But that is not a requirement to start playing, whereas owning a console is, is pretty much a requirement to, to start playing on a console. So, PC falls somewhere in the middle and there's a high divergence in the type of players there. Uh, now there's one additional here that we found through our partners, um, which is cloud gaming. And we actually saw a remarkably high growth in cloud gaming. Obviously, if we put it in perspective to the absolute numbers for the first three, it's not that impressive, but percentage wise, the growth in cloud players is massive. Um, and the stickiness is, is medium. Um, probably because it's it's a relatively new concept for many people, uh, the many people that picked it up. And uh, they might stick around for longer, but it doesn't have the same upfront investment that PC and console gaming has. So um, it will also be easier to stop playing as soon as people realize that they no longer have an interest in playing as much. Um, but yeah, the, obviously being the, the main advantage of cloud playing is the immediate gratification of playing games um, for console and PC gaming, and that's both time-wise and money-wise, like you pay a monthly fee um, and you don't need to set it up, you don't need to download anything, at least if you, if players uh, use some of the more accessible cloud, uh, cloud game providers. So, um, yeah, it was a very good, uh, very good moment for cloud gaming as well. Um, that was briefly on the or on the uh, impact of COVID-19, and I want to look ahead to the next uh, trend, uh, which is of course the launch of the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox Series X at the end of this year. 
Uh, and that will have a massive, that already has a massive effect on the games market, and it will do so more, and especially in the context of what I talked about earlier. Um, and the first thing that I wanted to talk about is, is how, what has actually been going on for a couple of years, um, how the next generation console really looks like the diverging path for Xbox and PlayStation, if you've been following the news a bit, which I'm sure most people will have is that um, Xbox is, or the people from Microsoft Xbox are talking about this a lot as well. Um, but Xbox is really more getting in line with Microsoft service oriented business, whereas PlayStation um, and Nintendo, although not launching a new console, um, are very much sticking to the to product oriented games business. <laughs> and, um, and why is that? Um, again, uh, Xbox, their number one priority is no longer, uh, or it looks to be no longer selling the console, um, but it looks to get people into the Xbox ecosystem. And whether that is through the Series X, whether that is through the um, lighter version that they're they're looking to release, whether that is on Game Pass for PC, whether it's through the Xbox Store and PC, that, that is not the most important thing. The most important thing is that players are playing in that ecosystem. And that's why they're offering multiple play, ways to play. So that's Game Pass for PC and console. That's the Live Gold, which they've had in the current consoles, which we're sure will continue. Um, and the xCloud service, which, as we just learned, they are going to offer in combination with the Game Pass Ultimate. Um, and it's also short, yeah, it's why they are so innovative in the cloud and subscription space. Um, they're willing to sacrifice product sales uh, to get into a stronger position for the current common generation. Uh, to give a bit more background on that, the way we look at it, if uh, say you are a relatively hardcore gamer or a core gamer, you have a gaming PC and you're looking, do I want to buy an Xbox or a PlayStation? Now, in previous years, most people would look at the exclusive content available on this uh, console. Like, do I like the Xbox exclusive content more? Do I like the PlayStation exclusive content more? And yes, of course, you will also look at other factors, such as what are my friends playing, etc. Um, but the last generation or the current generation really found that that you know PlayStation was was just better represented in that. I, I think uh, I can say that um, without hopefully not offending too many people. Um, so that was a major driver for people to pick a PlayStation. That's part of the reason why the PlayStation Four had the highest install base. Um, but now Xbox is, is has invested in studios. They acquired multiple studios over the past couple of years. They've invested in their own development studios. Um, yet they make the choice to launch every game that they develop from their studios on PC at the same time as console. Now that shows to us that um, you know selling the Xbox Series X is no longer the first priority. Because if that was the case, then they would um, they would make it exclusive for the console, as, as PlayStation is probably going to do uh, still. Um, and that's also why they're pushing the agenda for cross-platform play. Uh, because to them, it just matters that you're in the eco ecosystem of Xbox and what device you use to exit this is, is less important. Not completely unimportant, but less important. Uh, and on the other hand of the spectrum, PlayStation and Nintendo benefit most from maintaining the status quo because, um, well, PlayStation has the highest install base. Nintendo is doing very well, um, you know, carving their own path. Um, but both of them do that on the strength of their first party content, uh, which is what kept Sony ahead of Microsoft and um, what keeps Nintendo unique. Um, and through that, the one best way to play that content, to experience that content is on their proprietary console hardware. Um, and therefore they're slower to develop um, or not developing these subscription services, these cloud services. Of course there's PlayStation now, but it doesn't nearly have the same investment, the same commitment to it as Microsoft has on their um, subscription services. Now, looking ahead of what that means for the um, <coughs> publishers, that changes as well. So I'll probably go through this a bit quicker, um, but the role of the publisher faces continuous disruption. And, you know, this shift towards a service oriented market is, is forcing them to change once again. Uh, now, Looking back, the traditional role of the publishers, you know, focusing on expertise in distribution, sales, marketing, PR, um, they were an investment, they provided the funds required for developers to develop the game to do their thing. 
Um, but that role was already disrupted many years ago from disruptive forces box to digital, the development of online distribution platforms, games as service, strength of IP, um, which has shifted the role um, into their more recent role, which is that of an investor still, um, but also of the developer, publisher, and online distributor in one. So getting the studios in-house, um, having them develop games for you, and then distributing that through Battle.net or um, Uplay, their own launcher, so that they control the entire from development to getting it to the consumers. But that role is again being dis um, disrupted uh, through these subscription-based services, looking at Stadia, uh, but also looking at Game Pass, uh, which is further increasing the value of UP, um, value of exclusive content for these um, distribution platforms and services as well which strengthens the negotiation position of development studios, so the people that make the IP. <clears throat> Cloud gaming services has um, further pushed away games from uh, publishers onto platforms, and that will uh, eventually change from the current platform focus that we have right now to cloud-based services. And finally, all these services also widen the gap between the publisher and the player because there's a, a player operating or there's a platform operating in between them. Um, so publishers now will have to evolve into a new role. Not all of them, but um, many of them. So um, they no longer can take that role of being the, the, the player between uh, the development of games and the, the end consumer. So they might go towards different roles. So one of them being running their own subscription or, or cloud gaming services, which we see now many of the larger publishers develop now or they might become IP holders that generate revenue by licensing these right to rotating developers and licensing it to, to a rotating set of platforms, depending on the value of their. Or they still have a lot of expertise in um, marketing, user acquisition, some of their earlier roles, PR, and that can maintain their value add service for developers. Um, so the, the new role of the traditional publisher, it's still unclear. Um, and there's no doubt that uh, some of them might not make it, but it's uh, it's something that's happening in the market this year. Um, looking at the time briefly, I think I might go through this one still because this is something that impacts the market this year as well. Uh, a lot of data on this, but really the story here is that spending on consoles as a new console or the cycle generation enters, it, it changes somewhat. So. Um, I don't think I can highlight right now, but what I'd like to see is that there is a certain difference between what people are spending on software, which is the purple line here, and then what they are spending on hardware, which are the green uh, bar charts or column charts. Um, and it makes a lot of sense, but as people spend more on hardware, their spend on software goes down. And that, um, that effect is accelerated by the fact that publishers and developers also develop for that. So uh, the amount of content coming out this year compared to two years ago is a lot lower because people are now starting to develop for the next generation. But when the next generation launches for the first couple of years, that software spending will still be a bit lower than on average than what it was um, during the peak years of a generation um, because people have to reserve their budget or allocate their budget to hardware. Uh, so this is based on the on the current generation, the chart you see on the left, and um, you know just after the launch or just before the launch to just after the launch, these first couple of years, you see that spending on software games is probably on average twice as high as it is on hardware. Whereas you know during the five to seven years after the launch, um, it becomes as much as three times as high, and we're seeing the same pattern happen now in. 2019-2020, except for the fact that the uh, that the pandemic has really changed that spending behavior. So the pandemic meant that spending um, in 2020, which we expect to drop sort of towards that two times as much as hardware, uh, stayed really on the level um, of 2018-2019. So uh, it'll be very interesting to see how that develops. Um, this year and throughout next year's next couple of years as well. But, uh, we expect that this spending will still go down, um, but it might be a bit later. It might be towards the second half of this year. It might be towards the end of this year. It also depends on the content coming in, like some of the content that was delayed to the COVID um, 
looking at a game like Cyberpunk, for example, that might, you know, it's not one game that's going to keep that spinning up, but that does influence that, that chart. <clears throat> um, and then finally, the way we look at I talked about a lot of these things throughout the presentation, but I just wanted to sum up what the impact of COVID-19 and, and the possible recession, because we have to look ahead and see that, you know, once the world um, or once this pandemic is, is part conquered, then the hit to economies worldwide, the hit on consumer spending power will have an effect for many years. And uh, we have to look at that specifically in the content of in the context of a console launch, because that requires again that high upfront investment that I talked about earlier. Mm. So some of the drivers that will implicate the console launch, uh, the temporary shutdown of game development services, uh, looking at things like voice acting, motion capture, uh, design, which is outsourced many times, like that. All of that got delayed and that will launch current gen titles, but also next gen launch titles. And I think the main impact of that we haven't even seen yet. Um, and that will mean that console launch, uh, console sales and launch will be lower. Now the player growth, of course, more players means potentially more sales. Uh, consumer spending decreases. Of course, that has a negative effect if spending decreases then you can expect lower sales, but on the other hand, we do see that consumers might scale down into gaming, meaning that if you can't take a $1,500 holiday, then you might as well buy a new game to enjoy it. So there might be some uh, effect there, but overall, of course, if spending power decreases, then that is not a good way for anyone uh, that's trying to sell to consumers, particularly um, in face of the high prices for a new console or PC hardware. Um, and subscription and cloud to gaming, again, they offer a lower investment way here for gamers to enjoy the same content. So they might very well. Um, we already thought that looking ahead at you know, end of the year, it might be a very important moment for cloud gaming because when consumers are faced with the high price of a new console, which is looking to be at least $500, then hey, that 10 to $15 a month to be able to play these games and stream them, that might become a lot more attractive than it is right now. Now, in the face of a recession, that effect is amplified. And I think that would be the main takeaway that I want to give from this presentation as well, is that you know, COVID-19 recession, it didn't really change the games market or it didn't really change the trends that shift the games market, but it accelerated many of them. And um, with that, I want to thank everyone here for uh, listening, uh, for being here with me. And if you have any questions, then my email address is here on screen. So feel free to shoot over an email. Um, and maybe we have some questions in chat as well. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you for such an informative uh, presentation with lots of numbers and interesting facts. As a matter of fact, we do have questions, but sadly not that much time left. So I'm just going to read out loud a couple of them. And afterwards, please, if you don't mind, jump in the chat by the stream window and answer the question yourself. Okay? Sure, you don't. sure. Okay, cool. So don't you worry, guys, if I'm not reading your questions now, Tom will be happy to answer them afterwards. All right, so the very first one, uh, what do you think is the next big thing for the console gaming industry? Oh, wow, uh, next big thing would definitely be the, the launch of uh, Series X and PlayStation 5 at the end of the year. Um, but that might be an easy answer, but that is what is on the horizon, and that is what is impacting players spend a lot right now. Thank you very much. Um, and the next one from Roman Ismagilov. Uh, the requirement of ISBN in App Store China how, do, how does the whole thing affect um, the mobile game revenue in China in this year, like 2020? Um, yeah, so that's a good point. Um, probably we'll say that it, uh, it's a negative effect. I, I think to a certain extent, the games that are being removed, the apps that are being removed, the increased regulations is... Um, is not going to impact the, the largest games being played there. So overall, um, uh, it might need to be as big of an impact as the numbers are going down in terms of app being published. Um, but there is certainly going to be a, a negative effect in spending if, if this continues. Um, and uh, we'll be able to tell more about the, the quantif 
be able to quantify that more as we get more results in from these uh, Chinese companies. So uh, keep an eye out on that looking at October probably. Yeah, because this is a big thing and everyone is very interested to learn what's going to happen next. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you very much for your answers. Sadly, we didn't have too many of them, but there are actually quite a lot of questions. So please do join the chat. I will. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us today. Hopefully, see you very soon offline at one of the shows, White Nights, for example. Yep. And have a great day. Thank you for joining. Bye bye.